Good morning, everyone. Bright and shiny, right? <laughs> Thanks for coming out today. My name is Karina Stipp, and it's one of the ladies who came in said, you're a realtor? And I said, well, I'll be the Vanna White, <laughs> and I'll introduce the Pat Sajak in just one second. <laughs> So, um, so I host the, the seminar series and we have a different subject with different expert panelists each month. Um, I started doing this and, and specializing in seniors uh, be, just because of the journey that I took with my mother and helping her downsize and realizing how just there's a huge scope of things to learn as you age. Is that about, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> And so, um, so that's where this series was born. And um, today our speaker, we're talking about the aging brain. And Lisa Levine is our uh, guest speaker and she's with the Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, Lisa, and tell okay. everyone a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, so I'm Lisa. I work for Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. You may have heard of us. Um, by that name or by Alzheimer's North Carolina, or we've been around for 40 years, we've had several names. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Programs, but my primary responsibility is to do education. So to come and answer questions about Alzheimer's and dementia, what normal aging is, what's not normal aging, and when we should worry a little bit about my background. I graduated with a degree in psychology and did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, but I had volunteered at a lot of nursing homes, and so I called one and they said, yes, we have a job for you. And I was an activity director the next day. Um, since that time, many, many moons ago, I've had a lot of people teach me through their own experiences what it's like to have Alzheimer's, dementia, what it's like to care for those people. And so I'm happy to bring that information that I've gathered all along the way and share it now so that we can all learn together. Okay, so um, let's start out with talking about what is normal brain aging and how, is, how does it differ from dementia? So what do you think is normal aging? What does normal aging look like to you? What does that mean for you? Anybody, just... You just start forgetting things. Start forgetting things. Go into a room and forget why you went into the room. Why did I walk into this room, right? <laughs> what was I doing in here? Where did I park my car? What is that person's name again? Those kinds of things, right? So if you think about dementia and Alzheimer's and those scary words, um, that's not normal aging. Let's just start off with that. Okay, so that's when something goes wrong in here. Normal aging is to think a little more slowly, to have to work a little bit harder to retain that new information. You know, we have to read things a couple more times. We have to process it. We repeat it to ourselves a little bit more, but eventually it sticks. So it is taking in new information and learning new information. It is having to wear glasses and hearing aids and those kinds of physical changes that go along with processing things. So. Um, you know, maybe our arms aren't quite long enough anymore or um, they're, they're, you know, too long to, to read things, that sort of thing. That's all normal aging. Um, normal aging is it's harder to do more than one thing at a time. We used to be able to do 20 things at a time, right? And our brains are actually built to do one thing at a time. We're just sort of getting back to that as we get older. Our focus might waver a little bit more. Um, it, it takes more work, but we can do all of the things we used to do. It just sometimes takes us a little bit longer to get there. So imagine, can y'all sign in for us? Thank you. Imagine that you have a computer, or I'm gonna date myself a little bit, a two or three drawer filing cabinet in your brain. How about this? A Rolodex. <laughs> you, soon I'm not going to be able to say that anymore. People don't know what that is. But imagine your brain is like a Rolodex. When you're 20, there's not very much information in there, right? 
There's a few little things. That filing cabinet is kind of empty. If we start filling the filing cabinet from the bottom, there's not a lot of files in there. Now, as we age, we fill it up. There's a lot of post-it notes, right? There's a lot of, there's a chair right here in the front. We're bringing more chairs. Okay. There, um, there's a lot of notes written on the backs of napkins stuffed into the filing cabinet in our brain, right? Oh, I want to remember that one little tiny thing and I put it into my filing cabinet. And what ha come on in. What happens is there's so much information that it takes a lot longer to find it. When we have to go through three drawers of filing cabinets or an entire Rolodex to find it and we're at the grocery store and we see that person and we know we know them but their name totally escapes us, right? First thing is don't worry because their brain is doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you're both smiling and trying to act like you exactly know who that person is and remember their name and oh hi! It's been so long. How are you? It's so great. And their brain's going and your brain inside you're going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So that's normal. That's what normal aging is. It takes longer. There's a lot more information in there. You have to dig harder to find it. What usually happens is midnight. Somebody's coming to chairs. Yeah. Two o'clock in the morning. That's when your brain finds it, right? <laughs> you've, you've forgotten about that person. You've gone on with your day. You're laying there trying to go to sleep. You finally got your mind quiet and calm and you're almost there and the name pops in, right? That's because your brain behind the scenes is going, I'm still looking, hold on, I'll find it. I'm still looking. So those things are normal. Parking in the parking lot, Walking back out of the store, not remembering where you parked your car, that's normal, okay? Um, I just had it right here and I can't find it. Where are my car keys? They must have grown legs and walked away. That's normal, okay? So you can all take a deep breath. That's, all right, we're normal. Whew. Okay, how's dementia different than that? If I lose my car keys, you wanna put something here maybe? I lose my car keys and I can't retrace my steps to find them, there might be a problem. If I keep seeing people in the grocery store who I really ought to know their names and I keep on not being able to remember names, there might be a problem. If I walk into a lot of rooms not knowing why I'm walking into them and it's happening more and more frequently, there might be a problem. And I always say there might be a problem. It's like red flags. One red flag, hmm, okay, 10 red flags, there's probably something going on, right? And so what's different for you? Do you lose your keys a lot and you still lose your keys a lot? Well, okay, not different for you. If you can already remember everybody's name and now you're starting to forget names, there might be a problem, okay? Does it get in the way of day-to-day -day life? Is this brain issue, this forgetfulness or this whatever it is, is it starting to get in the way of your day-to-day -day life? Are you really noticing something? Or maybe you're not noticing, but your partner, friend, spouse is really noticing something they're going gosh i just told you don't you remember and they have to say that a lot now usually when that happens we think it's not me it's you right i don't have the problem you do but if they're starting to say it a lot maybe there is a problem okay it might not be dementia so when you have that you know our first instinct is to not tell anybody that we're losing our mind is to not tell people we can't remember things, we're getting lost in comfortable places, we're having a hard time balancing our checkbook. We get real quiet about that, don't we? You don't want anybody else to know you're losing it, right? 
That's the time when we need to speak up because it might be a thyroid problem. It might be a nutritional imbalance. It might be that you're very, very dehydrated, that you haven't slept in a long time, that you are feeling the allergies coming on in the air, and all of those things are adding up into your brain not working well. It might be something that we can address. If it's a thyroid issue, we can go to the doctor and get that looked at and get that fixed. So those are the times when we don't want to tell anybody, but we really need to talk to somebody to know, is this really something I need to worry about? If you're not sure, ask, you know? Most of the time when you go to the doctor and you say, doc, I'm just having, I'm having more problems remembering names. They say, oh, we're all getting older. I'm getting older, you're getting older, it's okay. If you feel like it's more than that, say so. Say, no, this is not that. And as soon as you do that, usually your doctor will listen and say, okay, let's talk about it a little bit more. Not always. Sometimes you have to push a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how you're getting older, but that's not normal for my getting older. And so I want to talk to you more about it. And it's okay to bring that up. Sometimes, you know, that's not a once a year, I only can see you for 10 minute kind of conversation in your annual appointment. So if it's really bothering you, maybe we need to make another appointment to really talk about it a little bit more, talk with the nurse or something. Now, how does dementia work into that? So dementia is when something in our brain actually is going wrong. It's usually caused by some kind of disease it can be caused by a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, um, but it, most likely it's something that we don't know is happening. We do know that dementia can start 20 years before we have symptoms. So it's actually something changing our brain structure and our brain chemistry it's a disease. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to tell anybody I've got it. You know, it's embarrassing. It's not embarrassing. It's a disease. We talk about breast cancer and prostate cancer for everybody now. We didn't ever used to even say the C word, right? The cancer word. Um, now we talk about every kind of cancer there is publicly, openly, and on TV. Hi, how are you? But people don't want to talk about dementia or Alzheimer's and that's when we really need to start talking about it because I can guarantee you the people that you're talking to have experienced it in their own family or with friends as well so dementia is when we take all of those normal symptoms and they're a little bit more than that okay and we'll talk about that a little bit more so myths and misconceptions is that kind of lead into yeah. it does okay. yeah so the the number one question is always well I guess the number one concern is it's normal it's just what happens as you get older right mm -hmm. I turn 95 in two weeks so I'm gonna get dementia right no very normal aging is to be well into our 90s or you know many of us know people who are into their hundreds now who are very clear mentally that's normal that's what normal looks like so that's the number one misconception the next misconception that i always get asked is well alzheimer's and dementia is exactly the same thing right or um you get dementia first and then you get Alzheimer's. it turns into alzheimer's later and and both of those are no <coughs> Um, dementia is all the symptoms we think of when we think of Alzheimer's disease typically, um, but it's just symptoms. Dementia is the symptoms. Dementia is a group of symptoms where something's going on with our brain. But what's the cause of the dementia? Now that's maybe Alzheimer's or maybe something called vascular dementia. Or maybe it's Lewy body dementia, or frontotemporal. There's over a hundred different types of or causes of dementia. But 
there's always something behind that dementia. So a lot of times we will go to the doctor and we'll just get a diagnosis that says dementia. And that's okay. It says we have those symptoms, but it doesn't really say why. And some people don't need that. That's not me. Um, but some people are like, oh, okay, we've got that. We've got the symptoms. All right. I need to know everything, right? Why? What is it? When did it start? How long? Give me all, where are we going? I need every little detail. I'm going to go and read everything and scare myself on the internet. And then I'm going to go and talk to the doctor and say, is this all true that I read? And then what does it mean for me? Okay. So we can push a little bit past that, just a dementia diagnosis. Sometimes doctors don't know. It's really hard to tell the difference sometimes between some of these types of dementia. And a lot of people start out with a diagnosis of one thing, and then as symptoms change or progress, we get a diagnosis of something else, or they take a diagnosis away. Long-term untreated depression plus thyroid deficiencies and malnutrition can look like Alzheimer's disease. Wow. That's why we have to go at least to start to have those conversations about what could this look like, what might this look like, and what is it? Because we need to, those things are treatable, but we need to look at, is it Alzheimer's disease? Thank you. Is it Lewy body dementia? Now, it's a little bit easier if it runs in our family, but there's a misconception there that if your parent had dementia, you're automatically going to get it. And that is most often not the case. If your family members have had some form of dementia, your risk does go up. But there's a lot of other things at play. There's so many things we still don't know, too. So is it more likely you're at risk? Yes. Is it guaranteed? No. You could have all the genetic markers that says that you're going to have Alzheimer's disease and never develop symptoms. Why? I don't know. We're really not sure yet. Um, we're working on that part of it. The science hasn't caught up to that yet. But so there are a lot of misconceptions and myths there. Um, I think another thing is, is that there is no way to get a definitive diagnosis. Now it used to be, and there is a little bit of, there's a little bit of truth to that. So 102% confirmation of a dementia diagnosis is still going to be on autopsy. They're going to look at your brain and, and see what types of cells and damage you've had. But doctors are really good at diagnosing now. There's a lot of scans that they can do if you have access to them. And we're lucky that we live here and we have access to a lot of, of things, a lot of um, ways that they can give you a definitive diagnosis. The other thing though is you can have more than one kind or more than one cause of dementia at the same time. Um, so just when we've got it all figured out, there's that. You, it could be more than one. It could be that you have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Now vascular, we know, has to do with blood flow, right? Vascular, veins, arteries, blood flow. So that's basically the blood flow is not getting to our brain the way it needs to, especially in certain areas, so areas aren't working. What that can be is lots of little tiny, what we call TIAs, invisible strokes, if you will. We don't know they're happening, they're so tiny, but it depends on the area of the brain that they're happening as to where we're going to have deficits. Um, or it could be a big stroke and we can see it, but most of the time we can't see. Another uh, misconception would be is that we can actually track the progression of the disease. You can't call my office and say, these are all the things that my husband is doing. And I can say, oh, easy, he's at level three and this is what we do. <laughs> well, you know what? Sometimes I'm at level three, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means, but um, we all have ups and downs. We all have good days and bad days, right? There's days where you wake up and 
you're on fire your brain is just going and going and you're at a level whatever up here is and then you start to run late for things and then there's no chairs and then you feel bad about coming in late and then you've got lunch but you really want to talk to the speaker and so you're not sure what to do and then there's traffic and then you can't even and then your car won't start and they didn't have your reservation at the place where you're supposed oh. <coughs> by the end of the afternoon you're not up here anymore are you your brain has sort of gone down here and at the end of that day you're kind of down here right and maybe that's what level three is because I don't really know what those levels are I can tell you that there is sort of a typical progression for dementia but look around the room we're all really different our brains are really different how they manifest everything is really different and so everybody's dementia is not going to look alike it's going to look very different so that we can't predict what it's going to be now i can i could go through each area of the brain with you and tell you probably this might happen along the way but it might happen for some people tomorrow and it might happen in 10 years for other people. So um, that's really a challenge as well. Okay, <clears throat> so symptoms. So we talked a lot yeah, about symptoms right. already. The typical ones we think of, memory loss, confusion, not being able to do things we've always done well. One thing we hear about a lot is uh, I used to be able to balance my checkbook and I can't do that anymore. Um, or I used to be able to follow a recipe very easily and I'm missing steps now. Um, so it's sort of a lot of really complicated or um, sequencing kind of things that we start to have trouble with very early on. Another thing is just forgetting don't be alarmed this does not mean you have dementia forgetting what you just said <laughs> but not being able to go back to what it was and that happening more and more and more often so it's not the once in a conversation every once in a while because you have 20 things in your brain you want to say it's that it starts to happen because you can't follow the flow of the conversation or somebody you ask the question and somebody gave you the answer and you come back in an hour and ask the exact same question not remembering that you've asked it and that's happening more and more often maybe telling the same story over and over again but some of us do that anyway you know we just this is my favorite story to share with people so that's you know but it could be that if that's not typically what you do and you start to share things and didn't she just tell us that? Wasn't that, didn't she just say that? Didn't we just have this conversation? <laughs> Usually what happens is the people around you start going, is it me? <laughs> did I forget that we just had this? Did I, did I dream that you just asked me that question? Until we really start to notice. Another symptom of dementia can be that you don't know there's a problem that the people around you see that there's a problem, but you don't know there's a problem, which is really hard when we wanna get you to go to the doctor and you don't think there's a problem. And why is that? There is an actual like thing in your brain that makes you self-aware. And dementia, for a lot of people very early on, shuts that switch off. So you say, well, yeah, I'm a little bit forgetful, but I don't think I need to go to the doctor for that. And your person is behind you going, yes, you do. You don't remember anything. And then we don't, I know, you would tell you me, would tell right? Me, right. <laughs> right. The, the problem is, is that sometimes we don't want to hear that. And we don't, if you don't see a problem and somebody says, I think you have a problem, don't you go well maybe you have a problem I don't have a maybe you should go to the doctor right I don't think I need to go that's really hard so um, we just have to be aware sometimes that if somebody else says there might be something going on maybe we need to get that checked out okay 
So uh, what should he watch for? What should we watch for? What should we watch for? <coughs> you tell me. What did we just? What should we watch for? Not being able to find your keys. <laughs> Not being able to find your keys a lot more often, right? And retrace your steps. Exactly. What else should we watch for? Yes. This is the fourth time you've asked me that question. That, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and four, if it's only four, you're getting off easy. But yes, this is the fourth time, right? What else? Sequencing issues. Sequencing issues, meaning what? What do I put on first? What do I put on first? Exactly. That's a good or, one. I used to really be able to match and, and, and look <laughs> good and cared about my presentation when I went out in the world, not so much anymore. So if your friends are going, you know, you've, you've changed your style. <laughs> it's a really nice way of saying, do you not care anymore or is there a problem, right? So that's a good one. Yeah. What about just shutting down when you have something in front of you and you know you're going to do it, even your meds or something like that, and you kind of look at them and, yeah, I'll take that, and then you come back and you never took them. So Is that it could be. It could be a warning sign. Down? So if I'm getting ready to do a task, and, hi, how are you? Good. You can. Am I in the right place? You are in the right place. I don't know why you're here, but you're in the right place. Come on in. We all think we're in the right place. Couple of seats right over here. This is a healthy aging brain. Yes, you're in the right place. You can sit there. You can come sit here. Either way. So, now what was I talking about? I don't remember. Okay. Shutting down. Thank you. That's normal. See, that's okay. That's normal. So. If I have, hi there, there's a chair right there. If I have a lot going on, and, and this can happen to all of us, we have so much going on that we're overwhelmed. Sometimes that can shut us down. Sometimes I can look at this desk and I can go, that looks like a fun thing to do, right? <laughs> because I, I can't deal with that. That's one way of shutting down. But if we are trying to focus on something and we think we've done the task or we've gotten through part of the task and we walk away and we come back and realize we didn't finish, if that's happening more than every once in a while, it might be a problem. It could be. I would look at, are there other things in addition to that? Or is it that I'm trying to take my meds in the morning and I haven't had my coffee yet and there's 10 things going on in the house and I thought I did it but I got distracted and I come back, oh, I, I guess I didn't do it. Um, you know, there, there is a little bit of a difference there between I'm focusing, I'm sitting there, I'm gonna do it and then I didn't, I realized I didn't do it or I'm trying to do all the things or my brain is tired, or whatever it is. One of the biggest things that we can do to, everybody laughs when I say this, the biggest things we can do to protect ourselves and our brains is to sleep. I see only some of you laughed, which is good, but it's hard to get enough sleep, right? When you're waking up in the middle, no, you're the one. You're the one person. That's wonderful. No, good. So not only can, do you sleep well? Oh, I did last night. Well, good. <laughs> oh, you should be doing this. Um, so I would imagine another uh, thing to watch for would be changes in behavior, such as new aggression. Changes in behavior? and personality. So, and it may not be to the point where it's aggression, aggression, so to say, but it might be you are really testy and you're not usually. It might be that you're really touchy about certain subjects and you didn't used to be. So that's why it's sometimes it's hard to, to see these things. Because if I, my dad has Alzheimer's and he's been diagnosed for about seven years now, but before his diagnosis, if I look back before that time, knowing what I know now, I can go, 
he really was kind of touchy about some subjects that he never used to be. Or if anybody corrected him, if he misspoke or something and somebody said, oh, I think this, ooh, you didn't do that, you know? And, and now I know that was from the dementia, but at the time I couldn't see that because it's like, you know, looking at an elephant with a magnifying glass right here and not being able to see the rest of the elephant, you don't know what it is from looking right here until you can back up and see the whole thing. Um, and that's kind of what it's like is you get these little teeny pictures and then you have to put them all together. I always say, if you think there's a problem, go ahead and ask the questions. Go ahead and talk to somebody. Um, there are memory screens now that you can do online even. Um, some are better than others and some of them you will just scare yourselves, but um, you know, it's, it's Google. You have to know that it's not 100% true, but, but if you think that there is an issue, I do suggest that you talk to someone. Can I make a statement? Please do. <clears throat> I uh, took care of my dad in the last years of his life, and he was reticent about really questioning his doctor. Mm -hmm. And I got in the habit of going to all of his appointments with Good him, for you. and I would become the inquisitor. Mm -hmm. I mean, doctors kind of tend not to listen a whole lot, or at least mm -hmm. some of them don't. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have to have the courage to. Stand mm -hmm. up and say, hey, listen to me. Right, <clears throat> you do, you do. It used to be though, the doctors knew everything and we didn't question that, right? Once upon a time, you know, our parents didn't question their doctors. The doctors were the smart people. They knew everything. Well, guess what, they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. And if they're not seeing people with early signs and symptoms of brain change or cognitive impairment or dementia or whatever you want to call it all the time, they really don't know. If they're seeing more well people who come in for general checks, maybe some cardiac issues, that sort of thing. They're not looking at brain issues every day. It's not in the forefront for them. They often don't know. They get a little bit, and I mean tiny bit, of information about this in med school. And then if they don't continue with that or see people of a certain age or however you want to say that, they're not used to seeing that. So they're not, they, you know, they hear about something like we do. Maybe they read a little bit more, but they don't know. And so we have to advocate. Now, the other thing is if you have never gone to the doctor with your person, whoever your person is before, you need to start going because it's really weird if I walk up to you and go, hi, I'm Lisa, I'm gonna go to your doctor's appointment with you today, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, I don't know, why, what, no. So go be each other's ears. The doctor always gives you a lot of information and they say it really quickly because they have no time to spare. And so somebody can ask the questions and somebody else can write down the stuff or you can record it and listen to them later if that's okay with the doctor. But when you need to be there because you need to be there for dad to ask the questions and to be the set of listening ears and to go know the doctor said, da 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 da, we need to set that up ahead of time. Um, my, it would be weird for me to go with my mom to the doctor right now because she's pretty much fine. She lives in a different state. If I come in in town and she's like, oh, I got a doctor's appointment for my annual physical. And I'm like, great, I'm going to go with you. <laughs> Why? You're on vacation and that's a little... Now, it turns out my mom has had actually had health issues off and on for several years, and she's fine right now. But during those health issues, I was one of the people that had to help her through that. And so I went to some doctor's appointments. So now, if I'm there and she's going to the doctor and I say, oh, why don't I go with you? That would not be weird. 
So don't make things weird. Do them before you need them because somebody's gonna have to speak up. Somebody's gonna have to go to the doctor at some point with you and help translate or advocate. And if we're having any brain change, any kind of changes, you're not gonna catch everything the doctor's telling you. You're not gonna remember. They're gonna say, you've got an issue and your brain's gonna shut off right there and not hear any of the rest of it, right? Because I've got an issue. And then the doctor says all of these things. Okay, so what do we do when there's a problem? We go to the doctor. How do you get someone to go to the doctor if they don't want to go or don't think there's a problem? You call the social worker in my office and she'll talk you through that whole thing because it's really, really hard. But really, it's if you know the person needs help and you can't get them to be seen, sometimes we have to work around that out of a place of love. So we've all, we, know, we all know what HIPAA is, right? It's not a HIPAA violation for you to call your person's doctor off, doctor's office and go, I think my loved one who's coming in for their appointment tomorrow has a problem. I'd like to share with you what I'm seeing so you can keep that in mind during their appointment. That's okay to do. Whether you tell your person you did it or not, that's up to you. Even if you don't, that's okay. You are trying to help them. You're coming at it from a place of love and caring. You know, we're all like, oh, I can't lie to them. Well, maybe tell them after the fact that you did it, if you really have to fess up to that, right? Because if you tell them beforehand and they don't go to the doctor, it doesn't solve your problem, okay? Um, if we really think there's a problem, even if you can't talk to your doctor about it, talk to somebody. You can talk to somebody here at the Senior Center. You can call Dementia Alliance. You can talk to um, a clergy member. Uh, talk to somebody and let them know. Also, because that's going to put a lot of stress on you, and stress is a risk factor for dementia. So we don't want to add that stress to us, right? So we want to talk about that and have those conversations. Okay. What can we do to reduce our risk? What do y'all do? That's that's my always my first question. What do you do to reduce your risk? Or what do you do to make sure that you're aging in a healthy manner? There's no right or wrong here. Come here. Yes, you already did it for today, right? Come here, talk to people and learn things. Check. Yes. Read, learn, and new hobbies. All of those things. Whether they're one thing or they're all separate things. Good job. All right. Anybody else? Vegetable gardening. Vegetable gardening. I love that. Staying active. Absolutely. And what does active mean? It's different for everybody, right? But it's moving more today than you did yesterday. That's what active means, right? Exercising. How many of you go for a walk and you say, okay, I'm going to go for my walk now because it's good for my heart. You may have ever done that. Yeah. I'm going to go for a walk now to, um, I don't know, because my, my legs a little stiff. I need to stretch for my muscles or something. Yeah. How many of you go for a walk and go, okay, I'm going to go for a walk now for my brain. <laughs> Not very many of us, but guess what? It's good for our brain. Anything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. Why? Because the blood goes from there to there. That's pretty much it. But we need to get that blood flow going. We need to get that oxygen working in there. And so any way that we can do that is, is good. Learning new things. Trying new things. How many of you who are driving pull out of your driveway and then drive to your usual destination and arrive and don't remember the drive. <laughs> because your brain was on autopilot. It was thinking about five other things and not the drive, right? And then you get there and you go, I don't remember getting here. Hmm, okay, one, that's pretty much normal, unfortunately. Um, 
Hopefully your brain would have stopped you if you had broken any traffic laws. You would have gone, uh, I think we just ran a red light, right? Um, but trying to be present in the moment and focusing and really paying attention on what we're doing, which is really hard to do anymore, can be really good for your brain as well. Also, next time you're gonna go here to the grocery store or whatever, drive a different way. Turn left instead of right. And your brain will go, what? What are we doing? And that's good for it. We wanna have aha moments. We wanna wake things up. So when you get home this afternoon, go into your bathroom and move the trash can <laughs> and go about your day, okay? And then tonight when you're getting ready for bed and you have that tissue you wanna throw away as it's leaving your hand, right at that second where it drops out, your brain goes, wait, we moved the trash can. Now usually that only happens one time and then your brain goes, uh, you're not gonna fool me again. Mm -hmm. Unless you're tired, then it can happen more. And um, then you can move the trash can back. Also, I want you to try and brush your teeth with the other hand. <laughs> now when I said that, did your brain just go, mm. <laughs> So you just had an aha moment right there just thinking about it, right? Now, give it a try. Your, 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 everything in your brain will be going, this is not right, this is, and then you'll go, I didn't do a very good job. You can do it with the other hand and fix it and make it better. But it makes your brain step up, right? You don't have to learn an entire new language. Learn some new words and then use those words, right? If you do crossword puzzles all the time, that's wonderful, but you gotta mix it up. You can't just do crossword puzzles all the time. They borrow words from each other and get similar and stuff. So you have to mix it up. Do new things, challenge yourself, challenge your brain. And we want to physically move more. And we want to eat less processed food and more whole food. And everybody asks, so, the diet that's suggested right now is the Mediterranean diet or the MIND, M-I-N-D diet. And the MIND diet, they took all these acronyms. They took the DASH diet, which is for your heart, and the Mediterranean diet and combined those into the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. Low fat, low sugar, high fiber, tons of fruits and vegetables, right? We can kind of know that stuff. We don't always necessarily do it. So we just eat better today than you did yesterday. As you're going for a walk and talking to your neighbors because socialization is key. We learned during COVID, right? We were isolated and withdrawn and that really did actually, unfortunately, add some years to our brain. Um, but socialization, coming here, talking to other people, is key. Get enough sleep, manage your stress, easier said than done. First step in managing your stress is realizing you have it. What does your body do when you're stressed? Do you go, you know, so learn what symptoms your body has when you're stressed. Sometimes you may not realize you have the stress, you may have the symptoms. If I'm doing really shallow breathing and not noticing that I'm not taking deep breaths, I might be really stressed out. I might notice the breathing and not notice the stress. If I can learn that about myself, I can go, oh, deep breath. And then I'm helping to manage my stress. All right, all those things are doable. We just have to continue to work on them, right? All right. So when we get to questions and answers, one of the tips that we've had, and we're recording these and they're going to be replayed, so we'll talk about that, but <clears throat> we don't have microphones for everyone. So when you ask your question, let us repeat it back yeah. so that it can be heard on the recording and then answer okay. okay sounds like plan so now we're at 
Oh, it's not That's gonna. it. Okay, so I did bring for you risk factors um, for dementia. This was from the Lancet, a report recently. And one of the reasons I brought this for you is because there's some new things on here that we haven't always talked about. Okay. There we go. Oh, questions and answers. Okay. <laughs> Perfect timing. One of the new risk factors, not new, but that we're really learning about, hearing loss. If you don't do anything else for yourself, get your hearing checked. And when they tell you to wear them, you need to wear the hearing aids. Okay, does everybody have one of those? Hearing Maybe loss is tied more? to dementia, correct? It is now. Yeah. Now we know that it is. Yeah, there you go. You can have this one. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Need one. Yeah. So hearing loss is a big one. Now, is it that it's kind of chicken and egg? No. Is it I can't hear and therefore my risk goes up or is my risk going up and, and it's tied to actually losing it. It's more a matter of the processing one. And two is if I can't hear you, I can't socialize with you as well. Also, when you're listening to someone talk in a conversation, there's a ton of things happening in your brain that you don't have to think about. You're taking in the words, you're understanding the words, you're making um, assumptions, you're making understandings and impressions. Oh, okay. And then you're remembering, oh, I want to ask this question at the end if I don't forget. And, oh, somebody else said a question and this is going on and that is going on. And don't forget that you have to do the laundry later and all these things are happening, right? If I can't hear you, a lot of that stuff's not happening. So my brain's not having to do this. So it's doing this. And we don't want that. We want this. Right? So hearing is now one of the key modifiable risk factors to protect you against dementia. So you've got, you can use that. I've had people say, I'm going to use that for my person. They won't wear their hearing aids. I'm like, yes, you can use that. All right. Um, another thing that we know on there now is air quality. I mean, it makes sense. We're breathing that in. We're taking in chemicals. It's affecting our brain. Um, but we didn't really, really have that down as sort of the short list. Um, we have great or pretty good air quality here in North Carolina, in a lot of places they have really poor air quality, but also think air quality at home too, right? Okay, yes? Do you, do you know anything about um, the CPAPs? I've heard somewhere that they're saying that that can cause dementia, and I've been using one for 12 years. So actually, Sleep apnea is a big risk factor for dementia, untreated, because what happens? You stop breathing while you're sleeping. You need the oxygen, right? There's no oxygen. There's no thinking processes happening. Um, not really like that, but so yes, we absolutely have to address the sleep apnea and most people wear a CPAP. They're coming up with other treatments lately. There has been a lot of things in the news about CPAPs causing cancer. That's more from older machines that, and it depends on the material in the machine, what you're breathing through. So it's, it's better to have a newer machine than an older machine. They're coming up with new technologies for that. It's most important to use the machine and to really follow through with all of the care that goes along with that and everything because it's much, it puts you at much higher risk if you're not getting that oxygen in at night. Yeah, yes. Can I just add a note here, what my husband did, he had sleep apnea 10, 15 years. And, I mean, he was really bad. His first sleep lab, they put him on oxygen because he gets, mm -hmm. got so low, and, and of course. But for those that have problems with the mask, which he did, he hated that mask and the harness and everything <laughs> like that. Their Medicare pays for it, and this is 
uh, a dental appliance, not the sleep guard you buy at the mm -hmm. drugstore. No, you get a dentist who specializes in uh, sleep apnea and sleep problems, and it costs thousands of dollars, but your Medicare will pay for it. And he actually went to a dental appliance that kept his jaw forward, kept his throat open, because the sleep apnea is when your throat closes up on you, and you need to keep that open. Mm -hmm. The CPAP gives you pressure to do that. This appliance actually brings your jaw forward, and you breathe normally all night without a mask, and his sleep labs with the dental appliance was better than with the CPAP mask. Wow. So, so a, Medicare pays for it. a dental appliance, mm -hmm. called a dental appliance that, sleep and you have to go to a specialist, yes. but it physically forces your jaw forward and makes it so that the process that's happening when you have sleep apnea can't physically happen. And so, yeah, you're right. A CPAP machine is forced air and some people can't use them or they're uncomfortable. So I, I'm sure it goes the same with the dental appliance, but for a lot of people that probably works instead of the machine. So we have a lot more options yes. now. Enough. So, and I think that's great advice. If you have sleep apnea, don't give up if the first thing doesn't work for you because it is really so important for your all, overall health <laughs> in your cognitive health that you're breathing <laughs> at night. I mean, <laughs> to put it simply, but, but that's what that is, is, you know, your throat's closing. You're not able to get that air. It's cutting off the oxygen to you. If they had to put your husband on oxygen during the test, obviously the it's lowering your oxygen levels. CPAP, I mean, we go back 10, 15 years, I guess, when he first started. Mm -hmm. But yeah, his first sleep lab. That's where you go and you sleep all night mm -hmm. and they wire your mm -hmm. brain up and, and they constantly monitor your breathing, your heart rate and everything like that. Mm -hmm. To see so, how it's affecting you. Yeah. Yes, so yeah. Thank be, you for sharing that. To yeah. be seriously diagnosed for sleep apnea, you should get a um, yes. pulmonologist mm -hmm. to send you to a sleep lab. Yeah, you and have to do the sleep the test, and <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Well, stay the night, and they, they monitor you the whole, the whole mm -hmm. night, so they mm -hmm. know exactly. And his breathing would stop 15, 20 times a night, and his that's, heart would stop. That's a lot to stop breathing so, 15 times a night. So there are, <laughs> you can hear as we're having these conversations, you can hear that there are a lot of things that we can do. We, we call those, you know, there's, there's modifiable risks. We can eat better, move more, get enough sleep, address our sleep apnea. We can, um, if you have problems with blood pressure, we need to manage that. If you have high cholesterol, we need to manage that. Again, a lot of those things have to do with blood flow to our brain and making sure that that works. Now I do have to tell you, you can do every single thing right, 100% and still get some form of dementia. You'd be really healthy otherwise, <laughs> but we're just sometimes not sure of, of what that other thing is. And I've talked to a lot of neurologists who say it's probably a combination of a lot of things going on. It, you know, it's, yes, when you get tested, we are gonna look at your family history and possibly your genetic history and all the things that you're doing right now, but it may just come down to certain proteins in your system <coughs> that are not doing what they should, or there's an overabundance <coughs> of. Um, when you do go to the doctor for an exam, the first thing they're gonna do is ask you, you know, what day is it? What time is it? Where are we? Um, you know, what season is it? All of, of those things. I've known people practice before they go to the doctor reading them. You drive, cause I'm gonna, okay, you drive me there cause I'm gonna read the newspaper while we go. So now I can answer all the questions, okay? And I feel like if you have to practice, maybe there's a problem, I'm just saying, okay. But um, then they're gonna take that a lot further. They're gonna do all kinds of physical tests to rule out other things. As of right now, we don't, well, we don't have a blood test really that you can do that the doctor's going to do to say 
yes or no, or yes, you're at risk, or no, you're not. We're getting close to that, but we don't have that yet. There is one test at one lab that can say that you're at a higher risk if you go do that test. Don't do that test. You, you know, <laughs> um, there are things out there that you've probably heard of, like a lot of supplements for your brain, you know, things made out of jellyfish and stuff. Um, and I have asked some doctors about that, and they said for most, now, everybody, everything works for somebody somewhere. But for most people, you're better off taking the money that you would spend on those supplements and spend it more on organic whole foods um, and maybe a gym membership <laughs> rather than the supplements um, because they just mostly don't help people. Right? Yes. Uh, when, you, when you say the doctors, can you define what kind of doctor is the wrong? Yeah, what, the primary that's care? a great question. What kind of doctor? So most of the time you're going to see your primary care provider first. Um, and that's a great start. And some of them, you know, they're all over it. You don't have to go further than that. Sometimes, most of the time, they're going to refer you to a neurologist. Okay? Uh, not as easy to get in to see a neurologist much more difficult to see a neurologist specializing in dementia just because there's a lot of us and not so many of them um, that's okay though get on those lists be seen by them if you need to there are other places that you can go and be seen you can see geriatricians people that tend to see more folks that have these issues often know better how to deal with that. Um, you can see uh, Jerry psychologists, and sometimes there are Jerry psychiatrists that can be helpful, usually the Jerry psychologists. Um, there are some places, um, Wilmington area has a great clinic where they do a lot of early testing. You can do that here some too. Um, and then they'll follow you after, you know, we've got, we've got Duke, we've got UNC. They all have um, both memory clinics plus geriatric clinics with a lot of those docs. All I can say is you're gonna have to wait for an appointment because there's a lot of people that need to be seen. It could be, a, it could be up to a year. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, well, you might still want to worry, but you might also talk to your primary doctor, get on the list to see whoever that's going to take you nine months, call them every month and say, do you have any cancellations and put me on the cancellation list and then be ready to go if they do call you. Um, but then also see who else you can see in the area and look for other people. If you are looking for a specific kind of provider, um, you know, you can, um, you can call us and we can help you. There is a geriatric psychologist in the Pinehurst area who sees a lot of people. That's not too far of a drive if you want to be seen by someone like that. Um, people in the Charlotte area and in the triad as well. So um, it may be that you get on the list here and then you end up seeing, there's a, a dementia clinic practice in the Asheville area called Memory Care. Um, also hard to get in, but if you're on all the lists, you'll see somebody. So um, there are things you can do in the meantime, though. There are, you know, as soon as someone does have a diagnosis, we always encourage you, even before you have the diagnosis, do the things that you've been talking about in this series, like get your, uh, all your affairs in order, make sure that your person is the power of attorney. Um, you know, those are the big things, but I also like to remind everybody they're small things too. Like you have a care team. You may not think of it as that. You may think of it as your friends and your family and just the people. But if you needed help right now today, who would be the people that would step up and help you? They're probably your team. But do they know that they're, you're relying on them for things? So a lot of times people will call us in our office and say, well, mom lives alone. She's in her neighborhood and she's doing okay. And 
I check on her, I go over there three times a week, but if there's a problem, the neighbor would call me. And I say, but does the neighbor know that they should call you if there's a problem? And sometimes the answer is, well, they just always look out for each other. And I'm like, but do they know you're relying on them to be your eyes when you're not there? And sometimes people know that, but a lot of times we just assume that and we don't tell people and share that. I know you would do this anyway for mom, but I just wanted you to know that I hope you would call me if something happened or you didn't see her go to the mailbox in a couple of days or something. Just saying that out loud is a big deal because then that person is truly on the team, on the care team, and you can rely on that more, you know, because then the other, the other hand is, oh, well, I thought the neighbors might tell us if there was a problem, but dad fell down and we didn't find him for 24 hours. True story. Nobody was checking. Nobody saw him. Oh, well, I thought somebody would let you know. There was a, ABC had a special, you know that special, what What would you do? Yeah. And yeah. They, they had someone set up at a cafe with their computer and they tested asking the neighbor, whoever it was, they didn't know him, mm -hmm. the person at the next table, would you keep an eye on my things while I run to the restroom? And just by simply asking mm -hmm. that, then they felt a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't ask, then people could easily walk up and just take the computer. And the difference is they said, well, I didn't know if that was your family member that took the computer. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what you don't know unless you speak unless up. Unless you speak Th up. It's exactly that same kind right. of scenario where you need to be having those conversations. Don't just assume mm -hmm. because yeah. people, you know, they get busy. I know I keep a closer eye when Bob calls me. Mine is my neighbor, Bob, across the street. <coughs> Bob tells me I'm going to Texas. Then I'm on alert. I'm watching that driveway. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, you, you know, and I, that's I've. And, and yeah. you may always watch the driveway. You're just aware of your watching. I know the now he's not at the gas right. station or the grocery store. Yeah, you just I know he's gone for a week or things. whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you just know, and and a lot of times, people may notice things, but they don't know that you want to know what they notice. Um, I have a neighbor across the street from me, and every once in a while she'll text me and say, somebody took a picture of your front door. And I say, yes, thank you, that was my grocery delivery. <laughs> <laughs> or that was my dinner. But I always say, but thank you so much, and please continue to let me know when you see that, because the one time that it's not those things, we need to be aware, right? right? And we live in a little neighborhood. She wants to know who's at my door. I want to know who's at her door, just in case. So, um, yeah, but, but unless we let each other know that we want that, a lot of times people will do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other kinds of questions? Yes, Bob. Well, another comment. <coughs> I, have, I live alone. I put a lockbox next to my back door that has push buttons on it to, to open it up, and there's a set of keys inside. And I send a text message to my brother every morning, and he responds back to me, and he knows to call Karina if I don't do that. And so there's a way for people to get in to find me, and there's also an alert set up if mm -hmm. I don't respond to, to get to me. So but you know, I didn't know the code until you went in the hospital recently. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I didn't know that that was set up until the hospital called me and said, can you take Bob's phone to him at the hospital? <laughs> This just happened last week. He's he's okay, obviously. <laughs> <Hope so. laughs> yeah, but I didn't I didn't know, so you have to have that conversation. Now I do have Bill's number in my phone. We'd had that conversation mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But I didn't know about the key. Yeah. Yeah. My neighbor has a code to get into her garage and I only have to do that once every like every other year or something, but every once in a while I go, oh yeah, so I put it in my contacts as just, there's just a number in there ne near her name. Um, and so I know what that number is, nobody else knows what that number is, but I know that it's there just in case. And every once in a while I'm like, is that number the same? Sh yeah, okay, just to check in, just to make sure. <coughs> um, so it's important to communicate those things. We know, we all know those things, we all have those things in place, but sometimes we don't tell other people. Um, and, and a lot of us live alone uh, more than ever before, and we have to think about what would happen if 
I've got my cell phone. Great. <coughs> Do you take your cell phone with you when you're in the bathroom? Yes. What happens <laughs> if What happens if you fall in the bathroom and the cell phone's in the kitchen? You can't find it. <laughs> well, then we're going to have somebody come help you find it. <laughs> so they'll find the phone for you, too. Any other um, questions? or? Yeah. What's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? That's a good one. So what's the actual difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So dementia, like we said, is the symptoms. Okay. So... The reason you hear Alzheimer's and dementia used almost interchangeably is because Alzheimer's is the most common cause or type of dementia. So most of the time, if somebody has dementia, it's Alzheimer's disease, okay? Now what is Alzheimer's disease? It was named after Dr. Alzheimer. And basically, this is the very unscientific version. So if somebody's got a better one, let me know. But the proteins in your brain, certain proteins get messed up, okay? And they cause what's called plaques and tangles. Now you think about plaque in your arteries or even on your teeth, sticky, gunky goo that gets in the way of things getting where they should go, right? Um, and so sticky, gunky goo in your brain not good. Now, it's microscopic, but also tangles. Like, think of a tangle in your hair, right? Keeps things from getting to where they should be. The other part of that is there are neurotransmitters or chemicals that take messages from one brain cell to the next. And they start to get depleted. Um, and especially with Alzheimer's disease, these certain types of of neurotransmitters, there's fewer of them and they have a harder time getting to where they need to go because of the plaques and the tangles. And so the messages aren't getting from one cell to the next. Um, that's really the, the very, very basic of it. But um, so Alzheimer's disease can be in conjunction with other types of dementia, but it is the most common, depending on who you talk to, maybe 75% of everybody that has dementia maybe has Alzheimer's disease. Um, also, we used to joke around and call it old timers disease, but you can be in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s and get Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's much more rare it's called early onset, isn't it? Early onset or young onset a lot of times. And, um, you know, I've worked with someone who is 33. That kind of is mind-blowing a little bit, you know? But it happens. Now, 6 million people in our country living with, probably more, living with dementia, um, 200,000 maybe of those are under the age of 60 or 65 so much smaller and usually well about half the people that have dementia under the age of maybe 60 65 have Alzheimer's disease and about half of them have a different kind of dementia called frontotemporal dementia that looks very different that's a whole nother talk but um, lots of different kinds somewhere in here i think and i'll pull it out for you i have an umbrella so the umbrella is all the dementia is the symptoms and then under that umbrella is the spokes of the umbrella is the different kinds always the biggest one is alzheimer's because most of the time if someone has dementia they have alzheimer's um, now is it it doesn't is it hereditary if someone has dementia it like, should you, is there a way that your, your kids can be tested? Or so, my daughter was telling me there was a certain vitamin or something that, I can't remember what vitamin it was. So. There is, you can do genetic testing now. Yeah. Um, it's becoming more available. Um, a lot of times people won't do genetic testing for dementia until maybe somebody gets a diagnosis or as part of getting a diagnosis, they may test you and see if you have genetic markers and then you have the symptoms and if those 
match for a certain type of dementia. Now your risk goes up if you have people in your family that have had it, but it doesn't mean it's guaranteed. But the more people in your family that have had it, the more likely like the risk doctor, is. Younger, is there a possibility that yes, okay. that's it. If a lot of people that are under the age of say 60 or 65 have had it, mm -hmm. then there is a higher risk in your family. Typically, if that happens a lot and there's some families out in, or there used to be like in Western North Carolina and other areas, there's a certain genetic marker. They can look at um, your DNA and see if you have the certain genetic marker and that runs in families. So you'll like, you know, look at a family picture and half the people there had um, dementia under the age of, you know, 40 or 50 yeah, or something like, like that. Said, 20 years down the road that someone could have this. Right, right. so w all the research right now mm -hmm. is focused on being able to figure out you have it before you have any symptoms so that you never have symptoms. So it's like trying to figure out if you have heart disease before you ever have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to figure out that you have dementia before you have any symptoms. They're getting really close. There's a ton of stuff out there you've heard about. Some medications that have been out recently, especially for people very, very, very early, almost pre-Alzheimer's. Um, they're infusion drugs, so they're given by IV. There's a lot that are just now coming out. We're learning more about them. There's a couple of people at Duke that are getting it maybe a few at UNC and some of the other university kind of places that are starting to get the, treated with those medications. Um, and so we're just learning from those folks. When did we get the term dementia? And I know it wasn't when I was growing up. But it used to call it, everybody was senile. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, the, the, <laughs> it used to be senile dementia was sort of one of the organic brain syndrome which really doesn't mean anything um and and we would just say someone is senile we never said the dementia part but see and we took the senile off and now it's dementia but really what we're heading to right now is cognitive changes and brain changes because it's not just what we're thinking when we're typically thinking Alzheimer's. Um, there's so many different kinds of brain changes now. And you know, traumatic brain injury and those kinds of things go in with that too. You can get a type of dementia or brain change from long-term um, untreated alcohol abuse even. Um, so, and, and they all look very different uh, because they act on the brain in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize for missing your introduction. It's okay. I hope it's okay to share this. But, Please. Um, Something that you said uh, perked my ears up when you said there's such a short amount of time when you go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. In January, I was introduced to an awesome business that's over on Capitol Boulevard. It is called Centerwell Senior Primary Care Center. And I took the tour of the place and um, it's very welcoming and I asked it's Medicaid or however can be paid. Um, but they reserve 40 minutes for seniors that's because wonderful. they know it takes longer. Mm -hmm. And in their rooms, they have um, screens so that if your person cannot come with you, I that can it can be, be a Zoom call so that yeah. they can hear what the doctors are telling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're heading more in that direction yeah, now. It's a really neat looking place. We have to have that. There's several really here in town. Are there's there's one o opening in Durham. Yeah, there's one yeah. in South Raleigh. There, yeah. there are different places. And they also have a side room that um, is just an open area. So I don't know how if seniors want to come in to socialize if you just get lucky because another senior's there. But they do have some planning things. So it's mm. kind of a nice. overall. They have classes the, too. What there was, was the yeah. name of it? Centerwell. It's Center well. Senior Primary Care Center. It's at 3901 Capitol Boulevard, Suite 113. And anyone can go there, is my understanding. It doesn't matter where you live, you know, in Raleigh or mm -hmm. County. Anywhere. Yeah, yeah that's great. Care. Center well. Thank yes. You. Yeah, that's, that's great. Good. And I think we're going to see more of that coming. Um, and they have transportation yeah. and different things. That's nice. It's, it's a really neat thing. Nice. There's also programs um, 
there's a program called PACE, P-A-C-E, and the PACE program, once you're involved in the PACE program, you can see <coughs> all their doctors. You can, it's especially great for someone with dementia because you see their doctors, you can go to adult day programs, um, and um, <coughs> you can be seen while your person as at the adult day program, and if you can't come, to them, they will then send someone to your home to do it. Once you're in that program, you're sort of in that. You okay? I have a question. Yeah. <coughs> you were talking about the infusion treatments. Mm -hmm. What do they do? Is it, is it, so is the reason that's for the new, new, very, very new medications. And the medication that they're giving right now has to be infused and I don't know if it's every other week, once a month, it's very often that they have to go and it, that way it gets directly into the bloodstream and that medication slows the progression of dementia, but it's only for super early. Like there's this thing called mild cognitive impairment which is sort of pre-Alzheimer's, which a lot of doctors don't even diagnose. They don't even see people that early, um, but it's for very, very, very early. Um, and so it slows things. Now, the one medication that's out there right now that's received through um, infusion, once you stop taking it, you stop seeing the effects of it. The new medications that are in the pipeline coming behind it could be that you take it for a year and a half and then you see longer lasting effects. There's side effects with all of those as well. Um, so there's not a lot as far as treatment still right now, but there are a ton of medications in the pipeline. You can go to clinicaltrials.gov, the website, and um, put in the keyword of dementia or Alzheimer's and you can see all the medications that are in trial and what phase they're in and there's a lot of stuff out there. So it used to be when I started doing this in the late 80s, people would say in 10 years, we're gonna know so much. In five years, we're gonna, and we're this much further now than you know then but now i really do think in 10 years we're going to see a lot of things come yeah yes when you were talking about hereditary and family histories and i have an interesting situation because i have two sisters two older sisters who are now in facilities mm -hmm. one was recently diagnosed although symptoms were coming and we were seeing some of us were seeing things for at least five years. Mm -hmm. And um, I was dismissed by two geriatric physicians when I went to the doctor with my sister and said, look, you know, this, is, this has been going on. Oh, you're overreacting, blah, 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 blah. Oh. <clears throat> so these two people are not on my favorite list for sure, or anybody else. Nor should they be. And yeah. one is a, was supposedly a very prominent geriatric physician. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're overreacting, she's fine. Well, now she's in a facility. <clears throat> major diagnosis of Alzheimer's slash vascular dementia. But we had, some of us have been seeing things for at least for a long time, years. yeah. So now we have the situation. But looking at family history, the only thing all of us can remember, I'm one of nine, and I'm so, we have one has died, but I have seven siblings. We can only remember my grandmother's brother, who would be my great uncle, mm -hmm. had issues and was in it after his wife died. He did crazy things and that time, you know, poor Uncle Pat is crazy. Mm -hmm. But that was the only thing. So when my oldest sister ended up in a, was having issues, the first thing was she was having difficulty with her cell phone, trying to get the right numbers in it and things. So we noticed that was coming. But she is one of those very quiet Alzheimer's patients the lover, but she has now stopped eating, so that's a big issue. But mm -hmm. she's in great care. Mm -hmm. But my other sister, who was just formally diagnosed because of a major fall that ended her up in the hospital, and they did a scan, and it's like, whoa. And I had seen two brain scans with her geriatric physicians five years ago, and I'm saying, hmm, look at all this white matter. What's the deal with this? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's just general blah, blah, blah. And I thought, no. And I looked it up and I read about it. And I went back and I said, you know, gray matter, white matter, this looks, there were spots here and there, but now it's like a little bit clumpy here mm -hmm. and there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's blah, 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 blah. But so, long <coughs> story short, I have two daughters who we'll have two aunts now in facilities. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm under a microscope. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, four days later, after you have to talk to her in like four days, and I'll say something to her, I remember so. Oh, don't you remember you told me that last right. week? Oh, oh, I think oh, you're oh, else. Oh, okay. Uh, you're right. Okay, so it's like, all right. Do I have to write down everything I <laughs> So I don't tell them again. There's a lot and of I'm heightened awareness. Oh, no, yeah. Sisters. I said, look, mm -hmm. I'm 81 years old. Uh, I take care of Give myself. me some grace. I yeah. do everything I used to do. I cook for my blah, 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 blah. But the one sister, think that, like, there's so many things that you want. It's like red flags. Well, it's a big red sh bed sheet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, when are you all going to listen? Something's yeah. wrong. Yes. But she was a voracious reader, my sister. The one who was recently formally mm -hmm. diagnosed. Uh -huh. We used to compare books all the time. Being there. And then I noticed, gee, you know, I, we haven't talked about a book lately. So I called her and I said, what are you reading lately? Oh, I've been so busy. Mm, really? Okay, so I followed it and followed it and followed it. But here's the problem, and I don't know the facility that she's in, her daughters are trying to deal with and how to deal with. The things, what did this person used to do in their everyday life? Okay, so how do we keep as much of that yes. as we can? Yes. Well, here's a person who loved to read, cannot read anymore because mm -hmm. she can't. Mm -hmm. Was a big political junkie. Oh my lord. Now totally confused. So the two, th and she was a great cook. Mm -hmm. Are we all? Yeah. <laughs> so the three major things in this person's yeah. life are gone. And you make a really good point with that. Just because someone can't do what they used mm -hmm. to do, or at first they're trying to do it and it's frustrating to them, right. but later they, they're just not capable of doing right. those things. So how do we help that person right. when they get right. to that point? We can talk about, and I know we're talking about healthy brains and aging, so we're sort of at that beginning stage mm -hmm. of dementia and confusion kind of thing, but when someone gets through that part, and what do we do to continue to support who they would be if they didn't have this illness, you know? And so what can we do? We look at what they've always done. We see if that's still of interest to them. Maybe we read aloud to them, Maybe books on tape, you know? Even if they're not following the story, there are so many audiobooks out there now that can be played on any device. And maybe we play not a new story and not a story that, you know, goes forward and backward in time and has 25 characters you have to keep up with and all of those things. Maybe we play a very straightforward, simple story from when they were younger that we know they liked. Um, that's the great thing about knowing your person is then you can take their stories and their likes and dislikes and give that back to them. Um, so I told you guys at the start of this that my dad has Alzheimer's now and he's in the middle going into late stages. And um, he, we recently had, some, he's in Texas, I have family there, but we recently had some health issues. And during that time, he was not speaking a lot. He can speak, but he was not speaking a lot. And he was using more like pointing at things he wanted and telling you no like that and those sorts of things. But um, he would, something would happen in the room and it told me, I really know my dad well, cause like somebody would walk in or somebody would say something and I could just see a look on his face and I would go, oh, well, if dad was telling you his story, is it okay if I tell the story, dad? And he didn't know what I was talking about, but he'd go, mm, okay, whatever. And I would be able to tell dad's story or I would be able to say when dad was younger, he really loved animals. 
and he had a boxer and a lot of people around him didn't have dogs that were boxers so he had to learn a lot about boxers to be able to tell people the traits of the kind of dog and you know I don't really remember a lot about what was special about boxers at the time and then my dad would start talking and he would say they were you know lovely family dogs or whatever he his story was about his boxer that he always shared but it was like I had to prime the pump and really get in there to set the stage and everything but then by the time I gave his brain time to sort of catch up and get in the loop with me and then he could kind of take it from there and then I could fill in where he left off when I was younger I was like if I have to listen to this story <laughs> one more time okay yeah there was a dog and he was the best dog he's ever been and he was a boxer and okay and but now I can fill in the blanks of the story and I can then have a conversation with other people in the room helping my dad have that conversation um, you can find things my dad also I'm just trying to pull from personal experience my dad played our, uh, football for University of Arkansas big deal for him does not like professional football likes college football very important to know when you're talking to him big difference you know and how they play the game and everything they're not paid and that, anyway um but i can't he really can't follow the games anymore but i can pull out certain things that i know he really likes to talk about look at old games just have a football there for him to you know hold on to and play with and stuff tactily really gives him a lot of stimulation and helps him think about football one thing that he really loves we're not playing football obviously we're not even really watching live games anymore um we, you know but we can it doesn't matter what game we watch anymore because they're all live they're all new um so we can watch a really old arkansas razorback football game especially if i know they have already won <laughs> it's great I don't have to we don't have to watch the ones they lose because I know which ones they won so I you know that's helpful but it's so wonderful when you know your person and your people and you can really draw on things from the past dementia takes us back in time it starts with short-term memories of today and yesterday and this week and this month and gradually we go way back in time to maybe when we were children we start to forget who is living and who has already passed because we're not in this time anymore we're back in time and so if you can visit that place with them and talk about those things that are important with that person, you're gonna have a great experience with them. You can't drag people with dementia into the present. It's too hard. You have to figure out cell phones and remote controls and things. Let's go way back and we can do that with them. Thank you so much for sharing that, I appreciate that. Yes. Um, there's a, there's a A device that I, I would recommend that all of us develop. It's called Fun to Save Things Box. <laughs> and you, you put in there your kids' uh, Pinewood Derby race car, mm -hmm. uh, yada yada, yada uh, anything that you know, triggers fond memories, so that if you do get dementia, the the workers can go to your Fun Fun to Save Box. Mm -hmm pull out different items and that triggers your brain to go back to the I love the it. Product. How many of you have a box like like a, a memory box or a box of treasures or something <laughs> you know a box of things you've saved along the way right? That would be my house. Yeah your whole house. <laughs> okay so maybe we need to not do the whole house but maybe we need to find the special things from along the way that we now like to go back and look at and reminisce about because those are going to be true treasures.